Next Thursday, we will have Father Saltzman, Anthony Saltzman from the Greek Orthodox Church. He paints icons, and uh, Asen knows him very well and uh, does some things with him, so he might tell you how interesting it will be. So I hope you'll come back next Thursday night. There will not be soup. We'll be doing this at 6 o'clock, just as we always have. So put on your calendar next Thursday night with no soup. <laughs> you'll have to eat. Before you Don't forget Friday. 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 And then Friday, we will have Stations of the Cross, uh, self-guided stations around the lock, and so it will be a quiet uh, Stations of the Cross celebration or uh, commemoration. And so if you want to come, there will be paintings, uh, copied paintings here of each station, so you will go through the stations with a painting and a scripture and a prayer. So I hope you'll come. Uh, to that, and it will be uh, set up all around this space. And then Easter Sunday, we certainly don't want to forget that. We have three services, one at seven, that's sunrise, down to Plantation Pavilion. Then we have an 8.30 service at the Lake Club, and then we have a 10.30 service here at this space. So I hope you'll come to one of those. The children's services will be at the 8.30 service. We will have a place for babies and for um, larger children. If you have uh, grandchildren that you'd like to bring, we will not keep teenagers though. <laughs> Leave them all. Parents don't want them. Or make them sit still. <laughs> yes, Kathy. If anybody wants to order an Easter lily tonight for Easter Sunday, I can take it tonight and still make it so your dedication is on the list for Sunday. Okay, hear that? If you want an Easter lily, see Kathy after this session. And then the choir will be meeting at 7. <clears throat> well, we have had a, a process here throughout our Lenten series of moving through Lent with some very fun artists and some very wonderful paintings. And I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've learned some things. I certainly have. I've opened my mind uh, a lot broad, broader in, in the field of art and um, commentary, I should say. You know, every, every body has a story, and I've learned that every piece of art has a story. And to uh, really appreciate some of those um, wonderful paintings, you have to know the story. And so, here again, uh, this week, is my neighbor. He lives about a couple blocks from me in Athens, and this is Dr. Asin Kieran. Kieran, I always get the name wrong. All right, good. <laughs> he is associate, associate Professor of Art at the Lamar Dodd School of Art at UGA. He's also Associate Director, and he has done many, many wonderful things over at the School of Art. If you've never been to the art school, Lamar Dodd School of Art, you're missing a great uh, uh, an event or a great outing and so if you want to go just let us know and we'll try to work that out. Also the museum is right there, Georgia Museum of Art that you need to go see. Uh, <clears throat> Asin curated the Catherine the Great uh, exhibit at the museum not too long ago. I think I mentioned this to you and um, as I first went in and saw the exhibit I thought, well, this is okay. <clears throat> and then he started talking about it. <laughs> and it, was, it just came alive. There was a lot more there than you could just see if you walked in and went through. He has did his graduate, he's, been, he's from Bulgaria, did his graduate uh, work at Vanderbilt and Princeton. And he is working now on a private collection exhibit that will be displayed in the fall of 2016 at the museum. A uh, very bright young man and uh, 
I, I think you will enjoy him and what he has to say and who he is. Welcome. <laughs> so much for this generous introduction. I appreciate very much, especially the qualification of a young man. <laughs> I find this particularly flattering. Thank you. Ben. I will take it. So please bear with me until we make proper adjustments. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here and it's an honor to be here as well. Um, thank you, Becky, for inviting me. Um, I think that it's particularly special to have an opportunity to deliver a lecture on Christian iconography, in particular on the subject of the Annunciation of the Virgin, on the day when the Christian Church celebrates the Feast of the Annunciation of the Virgin. Um, March 25th is the traditional date for celebrating the event of the Annunciation of the Virgin, and it makes perfect sense because if you count nine months from now, then you will arrive to Christmas. And, and so what, uh, when Becky and I uh, started planning um, the event, um, I asked in particular for the Wednesday of March 25th because I thought that it would be uh, special to, to have this evening event and to consider uh, basically a two millennia old tradition of celebrating this major event in the history, in the sacred history of mankind, um, and to look into the images that were associated with this event, um, images that simultaneously convey uh, visually the story of the Annunciation, but at the same time um, uh, make multiple other statements and, and basically, this is uh, the specific topic of my presentation to you tonight. What else is the, in the icons that depict uh, uh, the Annunciation of the Virgin? Very little is contained in the text of the canonical gospel as far as the Annunciation is concerned. You probably know better than I do, uh, certain events um, are accounted for in all four of the canonical Gospels. And there are comparisons and some details come from one Gospel and others are found in another. Only the Gospel of Luke in the first chapter contains not more than 12 verses uh, that provide the entire account of, of this major, major event uh, in the sacred history of mankind. And in fact, the beginning of the redemption of the original sin, the beginning of the salvation uh, of mankind, and the foundation of most of, of the liturgical practices of the late antique and the medieval uh, Christian churches across the Mediterranean world. So, uh, if you refer to the Gospel of Luke, you will find out that um, basically, there are no details useful for a painter. <laughs> In the Gospel, that is very much the case. Um, and, and yet, we have a very rich visual tradition, both in the East and the West of Europe where amazing details are included in the, gospel, in the compositions of the Annunciation. And so one of the questions is, why would they do this? And the other question is, where, how did it occur to them? What are the written sources uh, that provide the information informing the decisions of artists? So, um, to give you a general idea about how this worked, um, I will have to introduce um, the um, literary or the textual sources that inspired uh, medieval <coughs> painters. So since Luke didn't provide enough information, and since the canonical Gospels don't tell us much about the actual scene of <coughs> the, the event of the Annunciation, other sources <coughs> became uh, the, important, uh, the important base for this. In particular, it's the Proto-Gospel or the Proto-Evangelium of James. This is a text of great significance for the development of the visual tradition um, in the late antique and early medieval Mediterranean world. Basically, it's 
this text assigned to St. James, uh, as well as another gospel named the, uh, the Gospel of Pseudo Matthew, somebody who medieval scribes in, in monasteries named Apostle Matthew, but he's not the, the author of the gospel. These two texts, both in the Catholic Church and in the Eastern Orthodox Church, these two texts are considered acceptable, but not canonical. Uh, the distinction is very important because if the text were to be considered canonical, they would be considered they, they would be considered to be inspired directly by the Holy Spirit. That's not what the Church asserted for these two texts, but at the same time, because these narratives were so rich of information that is so conspicuously lacking in the canonical four Gospels, for centuries, for two millennia, Christian artists have relied on them. And in particular, uh, the Proto-Evangelium of, of James provided the details that are so obviously missing um, in the New Testament, the childhood, uh, the youth of Mary, the, the youth of Mary the Holy Virgin, and the childhood of, of, of Jesus Christ. So when we look at some of the details, uh, I will have to refer uh, some of the details in the papers that we're going to examine. I will have to refer to these two uh, very important texts, considered not heretical. They're not heretical, but they're not canonical. They're just acceptable. And it would be very difficult for, for, for the uh, historical church to consider these two texts unacceptable, because then you have to deny all of the Christian art which of course happened, and we know that it happened with a great force during the Reformation in the 16th century, um, and I think that uh, we just have to examine these uh, images with an open mind to consider them not necessarily um, um, divine revelation. Eastern Orthodox believers would think that they are, but we don't have to feel the pressure to necessarily agree with them. I propose that we look at them as um, historical documents about the history of the Christian faith. Until the 16th century, almost uh, everybody in the Western world, in the Christian universe, considered them these kind of images visual divine revelations. Do you have any questions? I, I would like to ask you, whenever you have questions, to raise your hand. If there is a problem with my accent, and if you do not understand what I'm saying, I'm used to um, addressing issues like this. <laughs> After all, I deal with uh, Georgian undergraduates. <laughs> <laughs> on a daily basis. <laughs> With all due respect, you will not scare me right away. <laughs> oh, there you go. So, um, I would like to turn your attention to the oldest of the images depicting the Annunciation that I've selected to show to you tonight. It's a large icon, a panel painting, um, probably, paint, probably painted in the late 12th, early uh, um, 12th, uh, late 11th, early 12th century, and now preserved in the Museum of Art in Novgorod, in Russia. It is a Byzantine icon, though, because medieval Russia accepted Christianity through Constantinople. Uh, both the liturgical, the literary, and the visual tradition of, of medieval Russia um, depended on, on Byzantine models. So what we see on this icon um, are the two major figures involved in the event of the Annunciation standing, facing each other uh, discreetly. Uh, the Holy Virgin is standing to our right and she is approached by Archangel Gabriel uh, who has just flown in from heaven. He was, dispatched by, he was dispatched by God to deliver the good news. And you can see how, uh, how in a very subtle, in a very understated way, uh, the 11th century painters 
convey the notion that he has just flown in. Do you see his feet? His feet are not firmly planted on the ground. He has just flown in, he's hovering in the air, and we know that he's talking to her. First, because he's turned towards her, and second, because the gesture of his um, right arm is very telling. It looks like the gesture of blessing. So, uh, what, what we see here is uh, ultimately um, a visual sign that somebody is addressing uh, orally somebody else. This is the, ge the, the gesture of the speaking hand. And this is what the gesture of blessing in Christian art is in general. It originated in the practice of late Roman public speech. Um, late Roman public speakers had to deal with difficult circumstances in which they addressed the crowds at the forum, noisy places where everybody had something to say and, and they, everybody behaved somewhat disorderly. In order to attract the attention of the audience, a public speaker in the Roman tradition would make a gesture that would indicate to uh, the audience that he is about to say something, or that he is about to make an important point. And gestures like this were used for this particular purpose. For those of you who can easily uh, evoke the visual memory of Augustus of Prima Porta, the famous statue depicting the first Roman emperor, you will probably recall that he is going like this, because this is a portrait of the emperor speaking to a large audience of, of his uh, subjects. So that's where the gesture comes from, and it's important for us to see that Archangel Gabriel is addressing, saying something to the Virgin, because that's all that the Gospel tells us. Uh, the, the, gospel, the gospel tells us how the Holy Virgin was addressed by, uh, by uh, Archangel Gabriel and how, how, uh, how stunned she was. She did not believe for a second that what he was telling her is true, but she accepted her faith because she, uh, she was an obedient servant of the Lord and she accepted whatever his will was. So this, in a very concise, in a very uh, understated manner, is expressed by the basic composition of the Icon of the Annunciation. Um, another very important detail has to do with the semicircle at the top of the composition Right here, can you see? What you see there is the figure of God the Father. God the Father in this heavenly segment resides on his heavenly throne and uh, sends the Holy Spirit. A part of the painting is gone because it rubbed off. And it was a ray of light within which most likely there was a small circle, a small, a small medallion, containing the depiction of a white dove. That would be the visual statement about the Holy Spirit descending upon the Virgin from heaven and, and marking visually the moment of the uh, uh, incarnation, which starts, of course, uh, the, the, the first major event of the divine economy for for the salvation of mankind. So here she is, we know that this is uh, uh, an event that's happening at the will of God. That's why the most important figure in the composition is at the top, and he's the tiniest. Uh, but, but the placement above the other two figures is the one that expresses the notion of the hierarchy of sanctity. Um, and then, I don't know whether you will have to, the opportunity to see all of the details, but I want to turn your attention to some, um, one might say, at first appearing enigmatic you know, details. The Holy Virgin holds an object in her left hand. Can you see there is something? It looks like a, a red sponge right here. And then what is remarkable is that there is a, a red cord that seems to emanate from this red object and goes 
across vertically across the middle section of the virgin's body, across the, the, the virgin's torso, towards what appears to be a vision or a depiction of Christ as an infant. Can you see him? Yeah. Christ as an infant with an exposed chest seems to be seated in front of, of the virgin's breast, not as a real infant that, that the virgin holds. That's what you would see in a de traditional depiction of the Madonna, uh, or in a traditional icon of the Holy Virgin. Uh, Christ would appear as an infant, Christ's child would be there, and usually the virgin would support him in her left arm. That's not the case here. He looks older, he looks like a teenager, but at the same time, He's, he's so little, the figure is so little, um, and, and very importantly, the top of, of the, the upper part of his body is uncovered. All this is very important because this peculiar depiction of Christ makes two powerful statements. He's not a real infant. This is not what we, what we would call an image that is uh, created to evoke the notion that this is baby Jesus, a real baby who is fully human. No, this is a depiction that tells us this is Jesus Christ conceived in the moment of the Incarnation. He is fully human, that's why we see his human body, the upper part of his body, exposed. Like the body of every other human we can see, but at the same time he is not an infant, he is a vision of this divine eternal infant. And that's why he is rendered this way. He is right here. And so the red cord, the red thread that appears uh, across the middle part of the, of the body of the Virgin continues toward, towards right hand and this is the hand that seems to be about to start caressing uh, the, the, the figure of Christ, this vision of, of this fully human and fully divine infant. So, um, all in all, the two, uh, uh, all the details of the composition can found its explanation and we can justify their inclusion by reading the Gospel of Luke, except for the red object. What is this red object, and how can we explain its significance? Well, for this we need to turn to the Gospel of uh, the Proto Gospel or the Proto Evangelium of James, and uh, there we would find a very detailed account of an event that took place in Jerusalem at the time when the Holy Virgin was at the age of 14. She was summoned by the high priests of the great temple uh, in Jerusalem with ten of the other most righteous and pure virgins of, of the Hebrews in Jerusalem for the purpose of being charged to perform a sacred duty in service of the great temple. The purest of all of the virgins of Jerusalem would receive a substantial amount of purple wool from the great priests at the temple for the purpose of spinning this wool and uh, weaving a curtain, a piece of cloth that would, be hand, that would be displayed at the threshold of the Holy of Holies in the great temple of Jerusalem. This was an honor, this was a sacred object, this was the threshold, this curtain marked the threshold to the holiest of all holy places on earth. And that's, this is what the task of the Virgin was. So what we see here is a small amount of this purple wool and the cord that, that, that the Virgin has already spun, which very significantly goes through the middle part of her body and ends in her right hand, which is the hand caressing Christ. So we already see that this detail about uh, the, the weaving of the curtain uh, hanging at the Holy of Holies is interpreted in a, in, a, in, in a way that emphasizes its symbolic significance as, as a manifestation, a visual manifestation of the Incarnation. Why so? Because using the amorphous, messy amount of wool, 
to create first a thread and then a piece of cloth, a splendid purple piece of cloth, is analogous in its miraculous uh, uh, manifestation to the miracle that the body of the Holy Virgin performed by making possible the conception of Christ. So she created the body of Christ the way she created the curtain for the Holy of Holies in the great temple in Jerusalem. And for those of you who know the gospel even better than I do, uh, do, you, do you mind helping me by recollecting uh, the detail associated with the faith of this purple curtain? What happened to it on the Friday of the crucifixion? It was miraculously torn apart. That was the end of Christ's earthly life. So if you ever had any doubt about the deliberate parallel drawn between the Virgin's textile activities and her spinning and weaving and the symbolism of this purple curtain, all this is settled now because the event of tearing apart the curtain in the moment of Christ's death on the, on the cross is very relevant in this context. Do you have any questions or comments? So, well, basically, it's a very concise composition. Details were included, but almost all of them, except for the purple curtain, uh, for the purple wool, uh, can be associated with the narrative of the Gospel of Luke. That was not always the case, and I have an extreme example of it. This is one of the most splendid examples of Byzantine painting uh, from the 12th century. This remarkable icon um, was painted most likely in a major artistic center, such as Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, the New Rome, the city that Constantine the Great founded in his own honor. He was not suffering from uh, extreme modesty, as you can see. <laughs> this is already the 12th century, and um, uh, the icon is preserved in a very special place. Some of you might have visited it. This is the, the, the monastery of St. Catherine on Mount Sinai in Egypt. Until recently, this was a favorite spot for many tourists and many pilgrims uh, and art lovers to visit. Now it's very dangerous because you can easily be kidnapped there. Um, but the icon is preserved there. This beautiful photograph was taken in New York City when this icon was for the last time in the United States for a major exhibition of Byzantine art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This was 1996. And so that's why we have this amazing large uh, photograph. Look how busy this composition is. Apart from the fact that there is the Virgin and then Archangel Gabriel is coming, he's gesturing towards her. <laughs> Everything else comes from somewhere else. And I just want to tell you, to, to point out some of the details first. An elaborate throne is provided for the Virgin with a silk purple cushion. So she resides on a throne suitable only for the most exalted of, of, of emperors. Um, she's seated in front of the most fantastic building. Nobody can figure out what the building this is, but there are no such buildings. You cannot really build a building like this. Um, it's an architectural creation uh, that is uh, supposed to make a visual, a visual symbolic statement. It functions uh, an elongated space at the very top that is reminiscent to an early Christian church. This elongated design was the standard design of early Christian churches. But it's at the very top, so it's not quite a church. Right next to this church-like structure, oh, on the top of the church, there is a nest, and two birds are nesting together. Uh, below the church, there is a terrace, and on this terrace, there is an enclosed, elevated garden with blossoming flowers, with blossoming trees. One more time, at the top of one of the trees, there is a nest with two birds nesting together. Below this uh, exalted, elevated garden, there is a very large doorway. We don't know where it leads, but we see that the curtain at the threshold of this doorway is half lifted, suggesting the possibility of going through this doorway. So this is a penetrable, welcoming doorway. It leads us somewhere, and it's behind the Virgin. 
And um, we don't know whether this is happening, this event is happening inside.